Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, uh, Peter Fratzel from the Max Planck Institute in uh, Potsdam and co-moderating with Thomas Bauernhansel this uh, session on bio-inspired and bio-intelligent technologies. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome you all uh, in this uh, session. And I hand over to Thomas Bauernhansel, who will introduce the first speaker. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure to be a moderator today of the session probably the most interesting session of the event. And uh, we are very tight concerning our time frame, only 80 minutes to talk about that very interesting topic. So I will immediately um, uh, pass to the stage to, for, for the presenters. And um, we will start with the presentations. We have four inputs from different perspectives. And the first input will be given by uh, Lawrence Meyer. Lawrence Meyer works for Syncona LTD in London, UK. Uh, but uh, I, I think he will also say some words about his background at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, so he was, for example, a CTO of uh, GE Health and as well as a guest professor at the ETH Zurich. Um, he will give us a perspective on the pharmaceutical and medical industry sector. And the title of his presentation is uh, The Challenge of Individual Pharmaceutics. Lawrence, the stage is yours. Okay, can I get the first slide up? And uh, okay, so thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Peter. Uh, a great pleasure to be here. And good afternoon to, to the audience. I would like to tell you more about the challenges and opportunities with uh, today's upcoming highly personalized pharmaceuticals. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, I hope that works. Okay, good. Just some facts about the industry. A hundred years ago, it was uh, about half a billion dollar, relatively conservative industry, not too much innovation about by the year 1920. If we go on by the year 2020, it's a very different business. Over one trillion, one thousand billion dollar revenues in the global pharmaceutical market with a uh, annual growth rate, which is about twice as high as the rest of the economies around the globe. It's highly effective medicine, um, safe, uh, but also very costly. So compared to the year 1990, which you see on the right-hand side, when many of us actually were at university, where we had mostly chemicals, peptides, and vaccines. Today, by the year 2020, we have many more so-called uh, uh, therapeutic modalities, small molecules with mostly chemicals, large molecules with proteins, cell therapy, I will spend time on that, gene therapy, genome editing, and of course vaccines, which are in um, everyone's uh, um, interest, particularly in at a time of with the COVID-19 pandemic. If I go to the next slide, uh, we also see a huge impact already coming in from the human genome. Just as you see on the right-hand side, every one of us has 6.4 billion letters in the genetic code, ATGC, in every single cell of your body sitting in, in our chromosomes. And the remark, remarkable thing is that the total sequencing, so the determination of the sequence, the, the, how these letters add up, cost about 100 to 600 dollars per patient and that was just about 15 20 years ago a couple of billion so how is that going to change the way how we do pharmaceuticals in the future just a little bit of background you all know the central dogma of life which goes from dna to rna to protein it's basically the information on the left hand side is uh, transported over a carrier molecule into function which is basically the protein if I go to the next slide, if we have, uh, as illustrated by a red dot, if you have a change in the DNA, we have a change in that carrier molecule RNA, we have a change in function. So basically, that is very often uh, the reason for manifestation of a disease. And uh, there are many of these diseases. We know currently about seven and a half thousand, uh, eight and uh, up to eight and a half thousand genetic diseases in our body. So how do we fix these diseases? If you look at the left-hand uh, uh, side, lower left-hand side, these are small molecules. We all know aspirin, heparin, and others, which we give basically daily. On the upper uh, left-hand side, we see uh, biotechnology, as most of us know, 
uh, coming basically with recombinant proteins. And when you go around that, that picture in the middle to the right-hand side, we see since the year 2017, 2018, new modalities in gene therapy, gene editing, and cell therapy. And that's basically what I would like to, to bring across. These new modalities, they need quite a lot of uh, input from engineering um, and other disciplines. Uh, that is the topic for today. Particularly gene therapy, as you see here, was a global market of about $7 billion uh, by, by the year 2017. And the annual expected average growth rate, the CAGR is about 40%. There are not a lot of businesses out there which grow at that high pace. But what are the key factors? It's life-saving, high costs, very high growth rate, highly personalized, very complex in production, and definitely with a clear need for industrialization. And why are we doing this? What you see here on the left-hand side is current medicine. You have patients just illustrated by different colors, and some people, the blue ones respond, the gray ones, nothing happens, and some yellow ones, just for illustration, some people show even an adverse effect, so it, they have an, a negative reaction. In the future, we would like to personalize these therapies and make it fit like a personal suit, make it fit to every single patient so that everyone has the proper response, has no negative impact. But it means we need to put quite a lot of emphasis on um, personalization and putting an individualized element behind that. I want to talk particularly about CAR-T a revolutionary medicine for cancer, particularly for blood-based so-called hematological cancers. There's a lot of information. I don't want to spend time on that. But certain types of leukemia of blood-based cancers have a remarkable uh, curation uh, rate of about 60 to 90 percent, which we had never seen before. That is remarkable. So how do we do this? How do we achieve that unprecedented success in cancer treatment? And right now, it's only for hematological, for blood-based cancers, but there are ideas, and we can discuss that also for so-called solid tumors, solid cancers. So on the next slide, you see this is a very complex process. You start with a patient at the top. You go around that circle. It's a highly complex uh, uh, process. So each product is derived from a single patient and it goes back into that single patient. It's not like aspirin where the same medicine is given to all of us. As a consequence, these treatments, and you see some of these products on the right-hand side, they cost quite a lot of money. So can we industrialize that process? Can you make it better, faster, cheaper? That is the challenge for the business and for the engineers. And there's another process just... To, to, to make the point again, that is with personalized cell therapy, you take something out on the left-hand side, uh, uh, take tissue and blood samples out, derive a lot of information by sequencing and bring a highly engineered cell therapy product back. But the point is again, one patient, one product. So a huge number of different products and a huge need for industrialization and, and automation. So these are the challenges, highly individualized, high production costs and huge time demands, high workload for the lab, respectively the hospital, and of course, quite significant requirements for quality uh, uh, assurance and quality control. And what are the opportunities like back in the automotive industry when Ford brought the Model T uh, forward in the automotive sector, we have to industrialize, automate, standardize, optimize uh, that process for the sake of cost reduction. And that is basically what we see. That is the future of medicine as we see it coming since the last two or three years uh, and going strongly and heavily into the future. And last but not least, sorry, last but not least, I would like to make, why do we need the engineers? Uh, why do we need to do this interdisciplinary? There's, of course, that idea of conversion of three main scientific areas. It's biology, medicine, it's the engineering automation and it's the digital uh, data uh, dimension. And we have to bring it together. And by doing that, we hope that we can bring much better uh, life-saving treatments uh, to the patients at an affordable cost, and particularly in Europe. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for your attention. 
Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, uh, for your input. Um, we will have the time later to discuss as well some questions and some details concerning your presentation. So to the audience, so when you have any question, please type the question in the tool and later on we will try to answer all your questions. And now let's switch to the next presentation. Um, the next presenter is Jérôme Casas. He's the head of the IRBI of the University of Tours in France, and he will give us a few from the biological research on biological transformation. Jérôme, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let me give you a viewpoint from a biologist who teamed up with uh, physicists to produce a few uh, bio-inspired items. Um, I will talk about two items. One is neuromorphic computing. The other one is bio-inspired sensors. In terms of neuromorphic computing, you do know that hardware, the transistor size has been declining over the years up to a point where we are now hitting the atomic limit. That implies that now architecture of the system is what we should be looking at and animals can help us in this respect. They can also help us in the respect of energy consumption. Uh, uh, the software uh, table shows you the CO2 amount which is used up by an American life living for one year versus a fully uh, connected neural network which learns uh, natural language uh, processing. You do see that uh, it's, we are using way too much um, energy basically to uh, do these things. So we need to uh, have new ideas and biology can really help us in this respect. Uh, for the sensors, we worked on the crickets or cockroaches for many years. They have these um, two appendages at the end of the body, which are called cerci, on which you have thousands of hairs, very thin hairs, which are flow sensing. These hairs do fire with one thousand of the energy of a single photon, so that they really work at the thermal noise level, which is a very sensitive uh, template for bio-inspiration. So with our colleagues, engineer colleagues, we developed um, a, a MEMS sensor, mechanical electronic systems, where uh, the first generation was rather bulky, but then uh, the uh, second one was longer, and we ended up with what we call a flow camera. So instead of having pixels, you now have hairs, and these hairs will map small flows uh, and each hair gives you the direction and the flow speed at, in a very specific small region. If we continue with insect in terms of signal processing, these cockroaches have several brains. You have the main brain in the head, but you also, this is the upper uh, diagram, you have cell brains up to the top, the final one in the abdomen, which is called the terminal abdominal ganglia. This ganglion does harvest the information from these thousand hairs, and it will uh, condense it, compression, and send it to the main brain. So, and it will also send it mainly to the hind legs. So what you have is really a closed system with sensors and actuators, and you can think that the insect is turning away from a danger before the main head knows about it. Um, when you compare uh, the uh, neural network we designed based on this decades-long work by many groups worldwide, we ended up by having eight neurons, actually 16 for the two halves of the body. So 16 neurons um, uh, and a net network, network, which we then uh, compared to a fully uh, connected neural network of one layer, which contains from four to 1,000 neurons. This is the bar diagram. Now, this biodiagram, if you look at the green color, uh, you look at the false positive rate. So how often do I jump away while there was no need for it? It's, it's a mistake. So you do see there that the number of neurons you need to reach the level of the uh, network from the cricket bio-inspired we have is between 128 and 256 neurons, way more neurons than we have in our bio-inspired network. The situation is even worse if you compare the number of parameters or connections from these uh, uh, networks. The blue diagram shows you the number of net, uh, parameters, connections, in the uh, artificial network versus uh, the cricket, which is this basic uh, um, horizontal line. So uh, in other words, 
this Mao-inspired architecture do reduce the memory requirements by orders of magnitudes. And even better, you do understand the final network once the network has learned the, 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 the signals, something you just can't do with uh, non-bio-inspired neural networks. So uh, the final words, what does this imply for our society? We will maybe come back later on. I just want to list five. Obviously, biodiversity is declining very fast in a very bad way. So we need, industry needs to invest in saving biodiversity if we want to have bio-inspired designs. Biology is much better in terms of energy sparseness. When you meet uh, between biologists and physicists, engineers, you need time to understand each other. So a three years PhD student is not appropriate time scale. You need uh, twice as much, at least. Then our uh, flow camera is only one example, which went dead in the Death Valley in this uh, in, uh, TRN uh, framework, because we went up to level four, but there was no one to take over. And funny, I'm a biology professor. Uh, teaching has to be totally reorganized. I will say a few more words. And with this, I thank you very much and uh, show you a few people who joined the work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jerome, for that very valuable input. Um, later on, we have the chance to discuss a little bit more in detail um, uh, your perspective. And now I would like to, to switch to Eric Meiser. Um, he will as well give us an input uh, and the view from the mechanical engineering industry. He, is, he works for the uh, German Association for Machine Tools and Mechanical Engineering, VDMA, in the area of the corporate foresight. Um, and as already mentioned, he will give us a more detailed view on the mechanical engineering perspective. Um, Eric, uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. So thank you for the organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, so slides are up. Uh, mechanical engineering. Um, yes, so mechanical engineering is in the public perception something like, uh, you know, dark, hot, dirty, <laughs> Uh, but the reality uh, today is um, a very clean, uh, a, a very clean workspace with a wide view, probably on the Black Forest, right? So uh, what you can see on the right-hand side. So uh, just a short uh, intro on the on the uh, uh, machinery industry itself in uh, in Europe. It's 90,000 companies, uh, four million employees around 800 billion euro turnover of a total of uh, 2,600 billion euro uh, worldwide, um, makes the mechanical engineering industry rank two in, uh, in the world. And uh, so this industry is uh, rather important, um, also very uh, hidden to, uh, to the public, if you will. Um, mechanical engineering industry is uh, mostly SME, so other than automotive industry or uh, uh, other big industries like the chemical or pharmaceutical industries, these are SMEs, uh, often family business. And uh, the average German machine maker has 160 employees, uh, very important 80% exports, right? So uh, machines go to the world and equip the world, uh, 34 million euro turnover. And um, so where is mechanical engineering um, in this whole environment we are talking about, uh, from materials uh, to products, um, it's this uh, picture of the tree that uh, Pierre uh, Joris uh, showed uh, this morning, uh, also in the, in the same way. So from the material side, the soil, so to say, um, uh, mechanical engineering transforms um, uh, into products. So it's really at the center of it all. Um, without the production, you don't get the product out of the materials. And uh, this tree is kind of uh, the symbol uh, for, for the whole industry. Mechanical engineering uh, is the tree trunk, if you will. Um, so also one thing uh, you should keep in mind is that uh, mechanical engineering is very diverse, right? So we always talk about uh, production equipment, of course, but uh, we also have mobile machines, for example, excavators in that industry, heavy machinery like tunnel drills, for example, industrial plants like whole chemical factories or energy related uh, like gas or wind turbines, right? And you also have to remember 
uh, for all the discussions we have, it's B2B and not B2C, right? Uh, very important. Um, and um, um, what you've heard about uh, is Industry 4.0. Sorry, my headphone crashed here. Just um, um, Industry 4.0 um, is uh, self-organizing production, if you will. Um, to to have it in a in a short way, um, or and um, mechanical engineering is not driven or obviously driven by mechanics. Uh, but uh, in the 1970s, electronics came uh, on top, um, very important. Um, then also in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, IT, including uh, artificial intelligence, uh, came also on top. So mechanical engineering in the true sense today is not only mechanical anymore. Uh, and uh, that is also very important. So the uh, question is, what's next? And uh, that's where uh, VDMA, um, Future Business, comes in. We uh, try to find out the next big thing for the mechanical engineering industry. We have the narrow status, the trend radar. And uh, those are the topics we went through in uh, uh, starting 2016. Digitalization, AI and machine learning, advanced materials, which included uh, additive manufacturing and lightweight production. Uh, then climate protection, including power to X, electromobility, uh, hydrogen, autonomized supply chain, so um, the uh, supply chain inside and outside uh, the factory. Circular economy, very obviously a very big uh, topic also for us today. And then also progressive measuring and testing, which involves uh, quantum technology, for example. The next study we are up to is uh, biologization of industry, and uh, that ranks from uh, bionics and soft robots to uh, CRISPR cars and Corona. Um, so um, maybe it's just a short word on uh, circular economy. Um, very important, people talk about uh, recycling very often and um, reduce circular economy to recycling only. Um, but uh, it's not only about recycling of products, it's also about uh, production equipment, of course. and um, before you do recycling, it's much wiser to do uh, repair, reuse, and man remanufacture, right? So for a physicist like me, it's like uh, repair is war on entropy. What you see on the right side, uh, a repair manifesto from uh, ifixit.com <coughs> says it very clearly. And um, so um, what we did is, um, we checked um, our uh, studies and we checked our trend radar for a bio-inspired uh, product, and we saw a lot of it uh, already in, in uh, our studies today. So starting from neural networks, uh, cell sealing machines, DNA storage, um, and, um, uh, you know, circular economy, also change in mindset, uh, the biosensors for uh, the progressive measuring and testing, and also food processing involves, of course, a, a lot of bio uh, items here. So all in all, it's um, a very important part uh, already for the mechanical engineering industry. And uh, if you will, or probably the next big thing in mechanical engineering. So if you go from artificial intelligence from A to B, um, we have now BI from AI to BI um, biointelligence as the next step. So thank you very much for that. We'll have more on that later. Eric, thank you very much for your input. Uh, and uh, let's immediately switch to our last uh, presentation. Uh, Cheryl Byrne will give us now uh, the academic view on biological systems and maybe biointelligent manufacturing. Gerald, um, <coughs> is uh, working for the University College in Dublin, Ireland, and he is as well a member of the CIRP. Jerry, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, Jerry Byrne is my name. I'm a professor in University College in Dublin, uh, and I work in the IFORM Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to talk uh, here today. Uh, and on my next slide, 
just to, to begin with, I, I believe when uh, different areas are converging, it's absolutely critical and essential that we understand one another and that we have definitions and terminology correct. Uh, so that's important to start straight away with that. So here's a definition uh, that was published by a team uh, of eight people working in eight different countries that have been working together on this topic of biologicalization in manufacturing. Uh, and it's the use and integration of biological and bio-inspired principles, materials, functions, structures and resources for for intelligent and sustainable manufacturing technologies and systems with the aim of achieving their full potential. So uh, with that definition, we move to the next slide. Uh, and uh, on this slide here, uh, as we're all aware, and we're, we heard just uh, a moment ago of the new development in biology and chemistry and the new materials, new products and new biomaterials, uh, new developments in the area of biotechnology, as we've heard. So the question that we put as an international team uh, is, is there evidence of a new breaking frontier uh, of Industry 4.0 uh, on this topic of biologicalization in manufacturing. Now, in the next slide, uh, I just show uh, very briefly a nice slide from Professor Neugebauer of the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. Uh, and here we see different elements related to biologicalization and manufacturing, the materials element, the design, the manufacturing itself, the transport, uh, the utilization, uh, and the recycling. And uh, pulling out the manufacturing piece, uh, we see the resources, uh, we see the machine, including the hard and software, uh, we see the human and the human machine interface, and then we see the individual processes uh, of, uh, for example, uh, additive manufacturing. So just moving on to the next slide, uh, in this slide here, uh, we really need to be looking at, uh, I suppose, how we're structuring this topic of biologicalization in manufacturing. And key words we already have uh, in this team here today, bio-inspiration, also bio-integration and bio-intelligence. So on the top part of this slide, uh, we see the biosphere, the technosphere, and then also the ICT element to this, maybe the ICT sphere. So this triangle summarizes, uh, you know, we try to summarize the meaning of biologicalization through the bottom left is bio-inspired manufacturing, where the, uh, the biosphere uh, gives inspiration into the technosphere. Uh, the bottom right is bio-integrated, uh, where you've got an actual integration of the biosphere into the technosphere. And then uh, if we move to the higher level of bio-intelligence, where we're talking about uh, learning or self-learning, decision-making uh, and reasoning, uh, then through the ICT-enabled intelligent paradigms, we're moving towards bio-intelligent manufacturing. So this is some level of uh, putting a structure uh, around uh, the, the, the different uh, categories that we are talking about. So moving on to the next slide, um, uh, if you could just uh, move on to the next slide after that one, please. The, the duplication there, yes, thank you. So on this slide here, I'd just like to report briefly on a, a project that was supported by the Fraunhofer Society, uh, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft on four demonstrators where we look very specifically at trying to determine can we actually get a performance enhancement in our manufacturing systems in four different demonstrators. So the first demonstrator on the top left uh, is a demonstrator in the area of design looking at bio-inspiration. Uh, and uh, in this project here, uh, using computational design synthesis methods, uh, we were able to look at an optimization of a manufacturing system. Uh, and one particular very specific example here shown on the left is a topology optimization, reducing from 312 grams down to 50 grams for a, a particular gripper. So that's a very specific example, a weight reduction in material and all of the significance of that uh, in terms of the sustainability and the environmental question. The second demonstrator on the top right is very interesting, uh, where we looked at replacing the fossil fuel uh, with microbial-based cutting fluids for a cutting process. Uh, and uh, very, very interesting results where we could see that cutting forces, the wear, the surface finish, uh, using these microbial-based cutting fluids, uh, we can get comparable results. In uh, some cases better, in some cases not better, but certainly comparable, uh, so very good potential opportunity for some level of replacement of the fossil fuel with these microbial-based cutting fluids. 
The bottom left then shows using the additive manufacturing process, looking at bioinspiration and biointelligence. Uh, we could see that uh, it is possible to increase the output strength of the product. That's the strength uh, of the additively manufactured part to, for example, to forged parts. So much enhanced increase in strength. A reduction in the set of time uh, by factors, maybe two to four indicated here, uh, or also then reduced scrap uh, through in-process control, real-time process control, uh, using advanced uh, control algorithms there. So then you, so you can see very distinct benefits here. And then finally, on the bottom right, we see for the example of an actual biomaterial, this case stem cell manufacturing, and a, a unit uh, 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 from the Fraunhofer Institute in Aachen, uh, where the, the use was made of biologically inspired control algorithms. And we could see in this particular example, a 30% increase in throughput here. So this was work undertaken by those uh, listed at the bottom of the slide. So on the next slide, uh, in summarizing this, uh, what we can demonstrate is that there is evidence and clear evidence to show that significant benefits can be derived for our manufacturing systems through this convergence of biology and manufacturing engineering. As I mentioned, potential redu reduced use of fossil fuels, reduced scrap through artificial intelligence, uh, reduced processing and setup times, and then reduced cost. So uh, work on this, this work here will be reported in a special edition of the CIRP journal, uh, which is to be published this year. Uh, and then, so in conclusion, uh, to, just to, to the next, the final, the next slide, uh, just it concludes where I should say that yes, uh, the signals are there that there is a paradigm shift. Uh, you know what you, what we just heard on that previous presentation. The indicators are there that uh, there is a trend, a movement towards biologicalization. There is evidence of this convergence. Uh, there is an intensification of research evidence, evident in this field. As I mentioned, terminology definition is central uh, because they are uh, somewhat different languages we're talking here. Uh, and then the developments have characteristics of this new breaking frontier of Industry 4.0. We didn't go in our work, we didn't go as far as classifying this as Industry 5.0 zero, which we heard in the opening session this morning. Uh, so we're saying a breaking frontier of industry 4.0. The opportunities, we believe that there's really strong opportunities for very high levels of innovation uh, and new market opportunities in this next phase of development of our advanced manufacturing processes and systems, looking at it from this biological convergence perspective. The performance enhancement of manufacturing I've already mentioned, and I suppose what we are looking for and what we need to progress is more examples, very specific examples, uh, where we can see that there will be performance enhancement in the context of also the bigger agenda of sustainability and the green agenda. And then finally, uh, and that's not, not last but not least, but the human and the physical manufacturing system will change. The relationship will change with this convergence and very, very uh, central and important uh, quest questions regarding the ethics uh, and also society need to be considered. And these questions of ethics shouldn't be considered at the end, but they should be considered in parallel with these scientific and technological developments. So, ladies and gentlemen, I just moved to my last slide. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the international team from the eight countries who've been working together on this topic since 2017. Uh, and I'd also in particular like to acknowledge the uh, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft for their support with this work. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, all. We had uh, four uh, very exciting contributions for different perspectives on uh, bio-inspired and uh, bio-intelligent technologies from pharmaceutical industry, from sensors and biology, um, from mechanical engineering and uh, uh, from manufacturing. And uh, I think we are now before uh, moving on to uh, the discussion and an introduction uh, uh, to this discussion. Um, we would like uh, Thomas and I to show you a few slides, uh, sort of the transition, so maybe I can have them. Thank you. So, 
The, the two topics uh, that uh, were uh, appearing in all the uh, presentations were bio-inspiration and bio-intelligence. And actually, there are some uh, documents where uh, we assembled with uh, the German Academy uh, of Engineering as well as uh, Fraunhofer. We assembled uh, some uh, of these ideas in books that you can see here. Now, let me, uh, let me uh, sort of make a few uh, more comments. The first one... Uh, is uh, a way of looking at nature in terms of uh, its uh, huge variety of functions in materials and systems. And this huge variety of functions is obtained uh, mostly by a huge variety of structures. So referring back to the first talk by uh, Lorenz Meyer, uh, not only medicines can be personalized in nature, even materials are personalized, material structures are personalized. And uh, this is achieved by uh, a, a special way of growing that sometimes is called adaptive growth. Uh, and of course, uh, these are uh, very interesting paradigms. Now, um, the, the next uh, idea is related to uh, our information society. Now, of course, uh, information uh, and digitalization are enormous drivers uh, of our current uh, development in industry and uh, uh, in the society in general. But uh, what you see on the left side is a look at machine elements uh, just from an information perspective. So how does the wheel uh, on the right side know in which direction to turn, assuming that the wheel on the left side turns clockwise? And the answer is uh, immediate and from a textbook of the 19th century about machine elements. Uh, the robotic arm on the, on the right side uh, requires two cables uh, to perform uh, these activities, one that brings information and one that brings energy. In the center, unfortunately, the movie is not uh, running, this is an own where a, a straight uh, stick uh, turns uh, into a helix just by a change in air humidity. And what that means is that information is actually processed uh, well by one or many brains, as uh, Jerome put it, but it can also it can even be processed without brains, namely in the material. So this is a, is a look uh, at, uh, at material systems in a more holistic way, where information is not only in digital systems, but information is everywhere, including in uh, analog systems. And uh, what this requires, and this uh, resonates a little bit with what uh, Gerald Byrne uh, pointed out, uh, this of course is not possible uh, without uh, a different approach uh, to uh, both the way we are working together and the way uh, we are uh, educating. I think we need to move uh, from a cyclic uh, processing uh, chain where we go from synthesis processing all the way to use recycling and maybe create a circular economy. We have to move from a circle to a network uh, where at every moment in time, uh, even during synthesis uh, design, or manufacturing is uh, already a consideration. And I think this uh, is um, sort of meant as a little bit of a starting point about uh, bio-inspired uh, uh, engineering. And I'd like to pass over to Thomas, who would uh, then comment uh, the next few slides. Uh, thanks, Peter. <clears throat> now I would like to, to add some thoughts uh, from my perspective. Um, um, Jerry already showed that idea of, of the different modes and levels from inspiration to integration to interaction as the different modes of the biological transformation. Uh, when we look at the, at the first level, inspiration, I think uh, we see a, a huge progress in the moment because uh, uh, with the help of, of new technologies, especially coming from the IT sector, for example, machine learning and, and big data approaches, um, and as well uh, concerning our possibilities on the on the sensor and measurement side, we are able to understand really better biological systems and we are able to transfer the knowledge um, from these biological systems to our technical world, to the technosphere. So we see the new level of, of inspiration and um, uh, Jerome showed the example of the flow camera, and, and I think that illustrates uh, excellently 
uh, what new possibilities arises on the level of inspiration. The next level is the integration level. Here we use biological uh, systems as, for example, production equipment, or uh, we, we use or we design production equipment to handle biological systems like maybe the uh, tissue therapies uh, Lawrence Meyer talked about. And last but not least, um, a very important uh, level, or maybe for the time being, the most challenging level is the interaction level. And that means that we really combine um, biological systems with technical and IT systems to one highly merged uh, system. And um, doing so, we um, design and use BioWare, yeah, which we fully integrate into our uh, system approach. And that opens a completely new world for the um, design of, of new uh, products, but as well uh, a new world to uh, establish completely new production systems. And uh, we talk about uh, so-called bio-intelligent manufacturing systems. And, and that means that we use um, uh, this approach to establish highly decentralized regional manufacturing systems, which focus on, on networked uh, approaches, uh, which, which are usually highly automated, and which are the basis for very sustainable on one side and a very personalized production um, of our products um, in many different fields. Yeah, and when we move along that biological transformation on that on the different modes I have presented, um, that opens then a new innovation uh, space for us, and and uh, we we are able then to think about completely new materials, for example, but as well um, uh, new sensors and actors, materials, new machine uh, concepts, uh, which we can then develop and establish with the help of that approach of the convergence of the different uh, disciplines. So we have to follow in that area a highly interdisciplinary, even transdisciplinary approach in order to leverage the full potential of that new innovation space. So this is yeah. probably a good moment, actually, uh, to uh, involve our uh, public uh, in this, uh, in, in, in to our more general, more broader audience. And we have uh, two uh, questions for the audience uh, for where, where we can have a polling. And we will uh, see at the end uh, what, uh, what uh, everybody is uh, thinking about this. Um, so let me, let me read uh, the two questions to the audience. So the first question uh, would be, where do you expect the main impact of bio-inspired or bio-intelligent technologies in industrial processes in, and uh, products? So the impact. And where do you expect the main challenges of bio-inspired and bio-intelligent technologies in industrial processes and products. So the first question about impact and the second question about challenges. So you should be able to uh, vote on those uh, questions and we will come back to them a little bit later. I think with this, I, I would hand over to, to Thomas and we would get uh, immediately into our panel discussion. Yeah, before we start with the panel discussion, um, uh, to the audience, uh, again, the, the, uh, the topic to ask questions. Um, you have now the, the possibility to, to bring in as well your opinion and to, to give us your input in, in the form of questions. So please use that. Type in questions so that we can uh, try to answer these questions and to, to integrate as well um, the audience a little bit better in the whole um, moderated uh, panel discussion. Um, but we have as well prepared some questions, that is, that is clear. So maybe we start with the first one. Um, and um, um, I would like to ask um, uh, maybe Jerry Byrne, um, what are the most uh, serious industry challenges in the next 10 years and how do bio-inspired materials and bio-intelligent technologies address these? What do you mean? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Thomas. So uh, just uh, uh, on the, the, the most significant or serious uh, industry challenges, uh, it's quite a broad question, but one of the key points that I think I would make there would be fundamental to this entire development uh, is the education and training piece. Uh, so uh, I suppose in the world of engineering, uh, there has been a lot of development in the area of bioengineering, uh, but this is different. Uh, and so how do we educate and train our engineers uh, for the future working in manufacturing? Uh, so if we, let's say, uh, as I raised the question, the breaking frontier of Industry 4.0, as I'm saying, well, digitalization and cyber physical systems uh, representing Industry 4.0 is nearly 10 years old now. Uh, and so uh, it's, we can still see that it's extremely challenging particularly for SMEs in Europe, uh, it's very challenging for them uh, moving to Industry 4.0 uh, from the earlier stages. And now on top of that, we're seeing this convergence of biology. So the benefits, uh, are the indicators are that it, it, there will be very strong benefits, but I think the people piece uh, will be central to that. Uh, I also mentioned at the end of my presentation, the ethics question. Uh, and I do feel that the questions of ethics uh, and the societal questions uh, are also central. And as I mentioned, we need to be very careful not to put ethics at the back end, but to integrate at an early stage into the, uh, uh, the, the process. So I, I would say at the moment, uh, most companies uh, in the current climate are highly challenged uh, with the industry 4.0, particularly SMEs. Uh, and now uh, this new development uh, is coming in probably rapidly in behind us. Uh, and I would say it is a very big challenge, uh, both from the people side. And then also, as I mentioned, I, I, I started my presentation with definitions, you know. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's a somewhat different language. Uh, and so people have to understand one another. Uh, so the, science, the engineers uh, and the biologists have to speak the same language. Uh, and so there's a whole changing situation there as well. And then maybe finally on the actual technology itself, uh, we could see indicators of performance enhancements uh, as we demonstrated on some of on the four demonstrators that I indicated. So there are very definitely benefits also from a sustainability uh, point of view, but it's very difficult for businesses uh, to really, uh, you know, continue to develop uh, with the existing technologies or the uh, digitalization type technologies and now bringing in another converging discipline in on top of that. But I think, Thomas, it's a very major challenges for companies. To, and we saw the average size of mechanical engineering uh, companies uh, in the earlier presentation. And so it's a major challenge for them to deal with something that's distinctly different and uh, almost entirely new. Okay, thank you, Jerry. So maybe you can have a swell of you from from Eric, uh, because you talked already about SMEs and about uh, machine building industry, and I think that's your domain. What is your opinion, Eric? Yeah, so the question was uh, most serious industry challenges, right? And um, I think uh, biggest challenge of the industry is probably uh, to cope with uh, climate neutrality, right? So I'm not talking only about uh, car industry, uh, this is a whole issue for for uh, all industries worldwide. How do we reach the climate Paris climate goals, and um, um, how can we achieve that? And I think, um, as you pointed out, uh, decentralized production, regional production, uh, is probably something where you can uh, really add to climate neutrality, uh, biological processes, um, uh, kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, have uh, nature as a role model. And uh, that's uh, very uh, CO2 saving, right? Another big uh, issue in, uh, in the industry is, as um, uh, Jared pointed out, um, Industry 4.0, 10 years old. Um, but uh, now we have Industry 4.0 with a sustainability aspect, right? So the uh, UN SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, plus Industry 4.0 is, is a very big topic. And probably you have seen it in my slide. Um, circular economy is one uh, of these topics. And if you combine circular economy, which is already complicated enough, uh, with Industry 4.0, uh, 
uh, yeah, then you, you, you get big effects. So you can use industry 4.0 um, uh, topics to really uh, cope with sustainability and vice versa. And of course, among uh, health issues, we see with, uh, with Corona, uh, personalized medicine, uh, Lawrence talked about that, uh, food and resources in, in, a, in a growing uh, world population. Um, it's for the mechanical engineering industry and the SMEs to stay competitive in a very multilateral world uh, with all these new uh, issues and with all these new uh, challenges. And as we also heard uh, this morning, um, this needs a lot of investment. Um, already climate neutrality going into uh, renewable energies is, is very investment intensive. So uh, I think that's also something the industry has to cope with. Okay, okay. Um, thank you, Eric. Um, and I think that is that is uh, the perspective of, of SMEs and as well of the mechanical engineering side, more the, yeah, the machine building and automotive sector. But when we look at the pharmaceutical industry and, and um, maybe at the um, uh, medical uh, sector, uh, we see already a biological transformation, right, Lawrence? So what, what is your view on that on that topic? So I would like, thank you, Thomas. I would like to build on the comments made by Jerry and Eric. And we see, I see uh, the challenges, of course, in the healthcare um, uh, disease uh, pharmaceutical space. And there are short term impacts like Corona, COVID 19, and the long term, which is basically uh, life expectancy, um, aging populations, um, and, and the consequences for the society. So there's a personal con uh, uh, consequence on, on people uh, individually and also on the society, as we see right now with the impact of COVID-19 on the economy. But what are the key industry challenges today which didn't exist five years ago? That's basically the question I would like to, to address. And for me, there are two. One is we have huge opportunities to develop revolutionary, much better medicine, which can basically not only tackle the effects of a disease, but can basically fix a disease. So these really life-saving, highly personalized, individualized medications, that's number one. And that needs a lot of input, particularly from the engineering people I spoke about, making these highly personalized products, where every product is a unique a single entity and you cannot use mass production. So here you need to apply the concepts what, where the engineers are particularly strong to make a product over and over again, cost effectively, reliably and so on. So one is on the production. The second one is on the information rich society. So when you all know Netflix and these things, but as a matter of fact, 80% of the data which are generated today are not by Netflix or, or, or Facebook and the like, surprisingly. They are generated in the medical sector. It's actually around 85% of every day's data worldwide are generated by medical data, particular imaging data, whole patient imaging, but also electronic medical imaging and the upcoming field of genomics. So just to wrap this up, so the two key challenges where the pharmaceutical healthcare space would need input from this um, community. Number one, it's on the production of new medicine. And number two, on analyzing the data which are needed to make these, these products. Can I can I sort of uh, continue with with you and uh, put sort of a second question? How will that actually change our daily life then? So I would like to start, <laughs> Peter. I would like to start my answer with kind of a realistic, but eventually a bit negative statement. The good thing is. We all are getting older and older. So our life expectancy is the upper to mid 80s today and eventually will go up further and further. So there will be more age related diseases. We all know about Alzheimer, we know about cardiovascular and we know about cancer. And here's my very negative statement. 
statistically, 50% of all people on this planet will have a cancer diagnosis once in their life. Every second person. So we have to do something about that. Similar but lower numbers are for Alzheimer's disease. So if someone was able to tackle that devastating disease called cancer by changing it, and, and the trick with cancer is every cancer is different. It's not, the solution is not one fits all. So the impact on daily life is we want to prolong life expectancy and rescue people from devastating disease. That is a direct impact which happens not outside of, of your home, but inside your home with your family members, with yourself. It's a direct impact on, on life, uh, um, ex life uh, expectancy, but also on quality of life. And, uh, yeah. yeah, should we, should we uh, maybe uh, look quickly at, at some of the questions we have from, from the public? Um, Peter, would you like me to come in for one moment? Oh yeah, there, sure. Just, sure that, why not? Just, yes. just, to, just to add to that comment, uh, you know, on daily life, uh, as uh, some of the material that we've heard, uh, and as Thomas has mentioned about moving uh, in a direction that uh, towards the bio intelligence then the capabilities of our technical systems uh, are increasing. Uh, they become more autonomous uh, and, as I mentioned, self-learning and so on. Uh, so I, I believe that is a very fundamental uh, change, makes a fundamental change to the nature of work and the nature of the jobs. So uh, the, the, the daily life, if you put the clock forward a couple of years, then the daily life will very definitely change in the, uh, the way that people uh, do work. Now we're seeing a change in daily life at the moment, uh, but then also in terms of you know what they're doing uh, and how they're doing it will be strongly influenced by systems that have higher levels of uh, intelligence capability, partly also through the biointelligence piece. So the job situation, I would say, uh, will uh, be significantly uh, have a significant effect on the daily lives of, of people. Yeah, this uh, the, ju just one remark. This has big, uh, of course consequences for how people interact with technical systems if they are learning and intelligent. This is certainly an important yeah. uh, topic. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay. So maybe we, we switch to, to some questions coming out of the audience and, and uh, uh, please, if, if you have any questions, send them the questions uh, to us. Um, there's one question, um, um, concerning the transformation process, and we talked already about how life will change and, and what that maybe will mean for the society. And then the question is, how can we, how can we manage s such a complex transformation? You mentioned already industry 4.0 uh, was already difficult for SMEs, and also when we talk about digital transformation, it's still very difficult for the society um, to really um, understand all the technology changes and to accept it and to use it in the right manner, um, as well when you talk about ethics. And now we add the next uh, wave with biological uh, transformation and we talk about biointelligent systems. So what do we think? How, how can we manage uh, such a complex process? Um, what is your input? Maybe... Um, Jerome, um, you have an idea about that. In terms of teaching, it means putting way more emphasis on uh, on uh, systems thinking, cybernetics. But that goes a bit against the trend which I see, and, and many of us do see this in, in the whole world, at least the Western world, is that at least biology students uh, dislike mathematics more and more. So we, we really have a problem because uh, our inspired design does need at least some quantitative thinking, if not mathematics. And if you end up your, uh, your study at the master degree and all of a sudden you encounter something like the Reynolds numbers or the Young modulus, and you have no clue how to think in terms of scaling, th then we have a real problem. And uh, uh, education, and needs really to be thought through so that students do get way more basic understanding of complex systems. I think cybernetics came basically more or less 
well, somewhat from biology or biology oriented people, no? uh, Wiener in particular. Um, we have lost that uh, completely in, in, in the meantime. And uh, everyone is very excited about bioinformatics, but bioinformatics is, is by no means what I mean. I really mean understanding dynamical systems and, and equations. Okay, thank you. Um, Eric, uh, when you would uh, think about the, the family owned businesses and, and the long term perspective they usually have, what does it mean for, for these companies? Yeah, so um, maybe to your to your question, um, uh, what what do we have to do to uh, cope with that transformation? It's uh, basically also a change in mindset of uh, of the people and of society, right? And this is something you you can change only on a long term basis. So uh, everybody has um, has now realized that. Uh, um, yeah, climate change is happening. Uh, COVID has, has brought some, uh, some, some issues here in, and, and people uh, understand um, that uh, things have to change and probably have to radically change. Um, we have heard uh, the talk of the Club of Rome this morning, and um, I, I found some uh, very good aspects in there. Uh, solidarity was also one of the parts. And... Um, yeah, so this is probably something the SMEs uh, do very well, right? So um, um, joining up in uh, collaborations, working together, uh, working together as a machinery industry and working together with their clients. Um, but one thing is also um, where the, the SMEs have to cope with is uh, this education part. So um, Industry 4.0 is now part of the curriculum of, of uh, mechanical engineers, of course, but um, artificial intelligence, for example, is, is, is not, right? So it's already pretty hard for the mechanical engineers to get artificial intelligence uh, data scientists um, out of uh, universities, right? So, and with the next level um, to get uh, biologists into mechanical engineering makes it even harder, right? So if you if you see uh, this nice picture I showed of the company in the Black Forest, it's not Berlin, it's not Paris, it's not New York, and it's not the Silicon Valley, it's the Black Forest, right? So people uh, usually do not go there and don't have it on their list, so the biologists or the computer scientists. And I think that's a challenge, and this is probably something we have to... Uh, we have to tell people, look, mechanical engineering is uh, very interesting also for, uh, for you people out there uh, and, and have a look at it. Mm -hmm. Also, what we try to do is to get uh, startups into this whole uh, equation, right? Startups, uh, young generation, new businesses doing nice things with AI or BI. <laughs> uh, is also very important. So we have a link to them too. And uh, there is a big affinity of uh, SMEs and, and startups, uh, not from the investment point of view, but uh, from the collaboration part. Yeah, since you're uh, mentioning uh, uh, artificial intelligence and the information society, I mean, maybe a, a question to the, to the whole round, who is, uh, who, whoever is, is wanting to answer. I mean, what, what do you think is going to be uh, the the interaction or the expectations for this biological transformation in in terms of information society in terms of intelligence uh, digital or not I don't know uh, Jerome do you have some some thoughts about this maybe yes when I speak to my colleagues at the Leti Seva in Grenoble this is a um, semi industrial research uh, organization of 1,400 scientists. Well, and they all more or less work on these issues. What they, they say is basically data protection. And, um, and I was thinking, how, how does biology make sure that not everyone is listening to what you say? And um, yes, data protection is, is, a, is a major uh, worry in, in the IoT business. Uh, I know biology can also be helpful there. There are a few groups worldwide which are looking at bio-inspired way to, to protect the data and not send it all over the place, like we will be do with, with our phones, or we already do with our phones. Um, 
uh, yes, that's probably my, my intake right now as, as a first go. Okay. Time is, uh, is uh, sort of running. Um, somehow, I, I, I'm not sure, do, is, is, is everybody still uh, on, on the call? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Thomas, are you still there? I'm still there. Um, I'm, I'm here, yes. Ah. And now, ah, okay. now you can okay. see me. Sorry, because I and <laughs> I couldn't see you anymore. Yeah, sorry about it. <laughs> I think uh, we are we are probably a few minutes uh, over already. So, do we? No, no, we still we still have some minutes uh, to, uh, to discuss and also to uh, maybe focus a little bit more on the Q and A's coming from the audience. Uh, there was okay. one very specific question, um, uh, Jerome. Um, uh, why did the flow camera get stuck in the valley of death? And what is the plan forward? Uh, for it, um, well, do we have, thank you for asking, do we have an answer yeah. for that? <laughs> thank you for asking this question because, um, <laughs> let, well, I, I try to be short, but this uh, project was funded by the uh, IST FET branch of the EU. They had really people looking far ahead for many years. And uh, so this is a bottom up approach. There was no industry linked to our projects or projects from the start. Um, um, I think that the, at least in Europe, I would not know maybe Germany because you have so many different groups at different levels of industrialization. But otherwise, I, I know the UK, I know uh, Spain, I know France, Italy as well with the with the groups on bio inspiration. No one really has this link to industry or industry like organization. This is why I have this second chair in Grenoble uh, with the hope that we could slowly transport. So we failed because there was no partner who showed deep interest, except the army of several countries. Okay. Thank you. So one, one other question uh, from the audience uh, is, is sort of gearing us a little bit uh, towards uh, sustainability issues. I mean, we have been discussing quite a bit on how to improve the state of the art and, uh, and uh, sort of getting better in, in certain things, but maybe uh, can we talk about getting uh, greener, if I'm allowed to use that word? Uh, so I think uh, we, we had some uh, comments already, especially uh, I think by Eric about uh, sustainability, but maybe we can go a little bit more in depth about this. Maybe all of us a little bit. I don't know. Uh, is anybody wanting to, to start with this aspect? Um, so. Uh, Can so I start then? Yeah, yeah maybe, please, maybe please I, I do, do start. Uh, at least in, in France, there is, there is a strong wish uh, from several ministries to make bio inspired being, by definition, sustainable, which was by no means at, at the heart of uh, the origin of bio inspiration, but uh, the pressure is very strong. Uh, yes, biological systems do use everything they can, and that, that's probably what we can learn from biology. Also, the, the idea of uh, exaptation, which is a strange word which we don't use often, which means using a function uh, for something else is something we could learn from biology. Today, technology is very much one aim, uh, one target at, at a time, at least for the sensor side. Um, but I, I don't. I, I'm, a, I'm a bit worried of having too much green all over the place without no deep thinking, which goes along. So. Well, I, I think maybe maybe one uh, one thought uh, could be uh, along the following lines. Um, I mean, one uh, I, I showed this this slide where uh, always one and the same material is being used in various ways uh, to get to generate very, very different functions. I mean, people uh, are talking about monomaterial uh, solutions to certain things and so on. So, I mean, maybe from a mechanical uh, engineering perspective, is there something to gain from this? Yeah. Do, you, do you want to, to say something about this, Eric, or...? Yeah, mono, mono material is, is, is very interesting. I mean, to, to reduce uh, the number of materials uh, used is probably a, a good idea, right? So, and what you showed, the example of um, making things um, uh, easier, more straightforward, even an analog way uh, is, is, 
is very interesting, right? So the robot that actually don't need doesn't need two cables and, and uh, uh, works uh, just by uh, humidity or changing humidity. Um, for the mechanical engineering industry, uh, this has always has two aspects, right? So material is always uh, something that goes through a machine. That is that tree model I showed, right? So you take material and process it by a machine and, and make a product, but also you use materials for uh, the machines themselves, of course, right? And um, of course, uh, when you use less or, or more standardized materials, uh, then you add also on the uh, sustainability part uh, because it's easier to easier to recycle, right? So um, we we had uh, we haven't talked about plastics yet. Problem with plastics is you you have it in so many various ways uh, with uh, so many various chemicals that you get in trouble with the recycling part afterwards. And uh, I think that's a very important part. And um, mm, yeah, also maybe one aspect uh, where, where nature has a, has a role model is the uh, over-engineering part, right? So uh, it's, it's always good to keep things simple. And over-engineering is probably something you also see in the uh, mechanical engineering industries. So uh, I showed this 80% export, and of course, this is not only Europe or the US, right? So there is also uh, countries like Vietnam or, or Brazil that probably need a, a totally different type of machines. We call that frugal innovation. And this is also something uh, this is, uh, which is inspired by nature, right? So bones only grow where there is a use for them, and um, they, they don't have over-engineering in, in their skeleton. So, um, yeah, so going from mono material through frugal innovation part, no over-engineering, I think that's, that's an important aspect of sustainability. Peter, if you like, I could come in there just uh, to add to that. Please do. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah so uh, just in, in what I reported there uh, on identifying four demonstrators. So the pre-process to that uh, was that we looked at the, the value chain uh, from a manufacturing research perspective. So we looked at the design of the system uh, and then we looked at the individual processes in manufacturing for discrete manufacturing. And then we looked at the machines and the systems. And then we, we looked at the overall systems and the networks and the uh, production organization. So in terms of the addressing sustainability question, uh, I would have said that uh, we all need to be interrogating very carefully and very deeply for all of the elements of the value chain of the manufacturing system, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a structured way as possible. And then, as I reported, then looking at trying to make the system more efficient. Uh, and, uh, you know, if there's benefits through the biology uh, converging uh, with engineering, uh, but th those benefits need to be demonstrated uh, and they need to be uh, assessed and quantitatively assessed as well. So I think there is a, a process from the manufacturing research side uh, where we can support the next generation development of the sustainability question. Thank you. Maybe, maybe just just uh, one one question uh, to to Lawrence, um, because when when we talk about sustainability, the social aspect is very relevant as well. Um, and and you mentioned that these uh, personalized therapies are very very expensive for the time being, and uh, and we talk about technology based therapies, and that means that that the whole production system will change, right? We 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 move more into a decentralized way of production. It's highly personalized. It has to be automated. Otherwise, we will not bring the costs down. What does that mean finally, uh, Lawrence, uh, for the health sector? And, and what, 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 what do you see there? What, what are the actual developments? It's a very, very interesting question. When uh, Peter asked about sustainability, I also was thinking not only about CO2 sustainability, but also affordability for every patient. And just keep in mind what we see over the last decades, the cost for pharmaceuticals has gone up and up. In Europe, it's between 9.6 and 12.4% of the GDP in the various European countries goes into the healthcare uh, sector 
In the US, it's 18.4. And the numbers grow at a faster pace than the overall economy is growing. So we need to look at the affordability of medicine. Otherwise, we might have a social problem in the medium or long term. And yes, I'm concerned, Thomas, if we see medicine coming forward at a cost, at a price tag of 1.5 to $3 million per patient. So that's probably not going to be a sustainable model from an affordability point of view. Hence, I'm strongly advocating, can we bring, it's the same as I showed the picture of Model T from Ford. We have to make a mass product, which is called medicine, affordable and accessible to the people. Yeah, and that's a different way of sustainability in terms of what we do, not only CO2 output, but also bringing it uh, forward, making it accessible to everyone in our society. So by industrialization of these processes, we have to bring the costs uh, down and uh, keep it available or make it available or keep it available for every patient and every person out there. Thank you very much. Peter, let's switch to the poll results. Yeah, um, the question is, how do I get them? Can somebody... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the director will, will show them oh, to us. Oh, yeah, ah. that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the main challenges uh, of bio-inspired and uh, in bio-intelligent materials and technology in industrial processes. Uh, so, uh, we, have, uh, we have an answer. Uh, machinery and equipment, 17% uh, in medical technology, 5% in pharmaceutical production, 17%. Uh, and interesting, in mobility devices or mobility systems, there is no challenges. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, do you wanna, anybody wants to comment uh, this from the panel? Nobody here from for expert in transport systems, is there? <laughs> okay, can we have the second poll then? Is the is it possible? So main challenges in uh, in uh, so the interface between uh, biological and technical systems. Uh, seems to be 13% people thinking that uh, this is a challenge. The integration, 27%, the system control, 20%, and the complexity uh, is uh, seen as the most important challenge. I think that's uh, uh, certainly mm. um, came through some of the talks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the, the second poll. So the, the first poll, I think, that was the, the that was the wrong question. The question was uh, where the biggest potential, and I think uh, so, yeah. and and there's nearly no potential out of the point of view of the audience in the field of mobility. And I think uh, based on the actual issues they have, it's understandable. <laughs> but in the other areas, <laughs> there, there is a high a high potential. Um, okay. And, uh, <laughs> That's interesting that because good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that completely reverses the conclusion, yeah? <laughs> right. Okay, so so I think with, we, we are now running out of time um, and it was a very inspiring discussion. Thank you very much to all participants and as well for your very valuable input. Um, Peter, what are the last words we want to send to the audience? Well, I think... Uh, First of all, uh, of course, we want to thank uh, everybody involved in, and in, in the various points of views. And I think one uh, uh, important thing that became apparent is that bio-inspired and bio-intelligent technologies are likely to influence very, very different sectors of our society. I mean, from pharmaceutical to machine uh, industry, manufacturing, biology, education. So it is something that uh, will keep us uh, uh, quite uh, quite busy if we want to pursue this topic. So I think, and it's definitely uh, very worth uh, uh, trying to do this in the in the future. So thank you all uh, for uh, being uh, with us. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.